This week, we're talking about another question that came from the Facebook group, which was, how do you deal with classroom rule breakers? And I will say that the comments that this post got in our Facebook group, if you're not in our Facebook group, it's Real Rap with Reynolds at Teacher, Real Rap with Reynolds Teacher Talk on Facebook. And it's a space that's only for teachers. So the educators that answered, I thought did an incredible job. So if you wanna check that out, you can go over. And as a matter of fact, if you just go to the top of the uh, Facebook group, there's like a little magnifying glass up there and you can look for anything, like just type in, you know, rule breakers or, or something of that nature. And the post will actually pop up, it auto populates. So you can search the whole book for anything that you're kind of looking for. And these sleeves are gonna make this keep writing on itself. So what do we do with classroom rule breakers? I think, you know, the, no matter if kids are very little, right? You're dealing with kindergarten, first grade, second grade, or high school. I think that no one is like, I will say this, very few kids I think are born as these sort of like, like I'm gonna push against the grain no matter what, and that just happened naturally. I think there is some of that, but ultimately I think all kids wanna belong, they want to be loved, they want to be able to show love, and, and I, so I think that is like, in my educational you know, experience, that is where kids would like to be. And when you get behind the story, you always find out that something else is actually going on. However, and, and I think that that deals with like, that is building relationships. And I have talked, uh, you know, a ton about that. And you can just look it up on the YouTube channel. But um, I don't want to necessarily go into that piece today, because I think that that is actually going to be your number one way to resolve issues. But in the moment, what do you do in the moment when a kid is acting up, when they are challenging you in front of the class, when you're kind of like, don't know what to do, what do you do then? And I think the first thing you do is, this is, this is far easier said than done, but I'm gonna talk you through it real quick. So the first thing I think is, oh my gosh, this is really, this is really gonna, this is what we do when we don't do edits anymore. We're, we're trying to do, trying to do this like it's a seminar, um, but it's gonna keep writing on itself. Um, do not take it personally. Sometimes words are too long. I'm just going to go like that. And there you go. That's what it says, it says personally. Uh, it's like, it's like Jeopardy writing. So I realize that that is easier said than done. But the reason I bring that up is because once, you know, there's, a, there's something I think that a lot of students get out of, um, make it's this sense of control right it is this sense of i have a sense of power and when you look at young people oftentimes they don't have power right and, and in my uh, this is not there's no science behind this that i know of but maybe there is because i i think it's right that you know when we look at like teenagers or even younger than teenagers now it is why do kids dye their hair purple or pink or wear you know like my friends like weird punk rock kids I grew up with who have like safety pins in their ears or whatever, right? It is this thing where this is what I control. This is where I can have a sense of power. And kids will challenge you. And when they see that you are, that you're shook, that is, that, that's a little bit of a light up, right? Oh, all right, I'm getting to them. And, and so as a kid that did this in high school, I'm telling you that this is like where some of this can come from. So it is trying not to take it personal. And how do you do that? Even if it does hurt your feelings or you are feeling like you're taking it personally, you have to just act like it's not. That's my best piece of advice. I once was told by a mentor of mine uh, when I was coming up as a teacher that 90% of teaching is acting. Sometimes we have to act like things are important. Sometimes we have to act like we're angry. Sometimes we have to act like something didn't matter. Sometimes we have to act like, I love this book. I love teaching Merchant of Venice every year. It's the best. I don't, I don't like Mitchum to Venice, but if I tell kids I don't like it, I have tried that level of truth and I've seen it have the opposite effect. Like kids aren't seeing that as being real. They're seeing it as like, well, then why do we have to do this? And then they just hate it. So now I don't tell them I love it. I just tell them this is what we're doing and I try and make it the best that I can possibly be. And then when we're done, I actually tell them that I, that's not my favorite work of Shakespeare. There's like 50 other things I'd rather do. So that being said, um, you are trying to act through that. I think the second thing you do is you simply talk to kids. And remember, 
you're, you're going to hear your mom or the person that brought you up coming out of me right now. Because I'm going to tell you that it's not what you say, it's how you said it. So it is telling students, and I, I report things like I'm reporting the news. I'm not getting my feelings in it. I'm not going to yell at you to sit down. I'm not going to tell you twice to like act, like stop acting a fool. I'm going to say, Aaron, because every, every kid that, I've had enough Aaron's that were issues in class. And so everyone I always go to is either named Tim or Aaron. Aaron, do you do me a favor and please sit down? Right now, I know there's teachers that have an issue with like asking kids like that, but that, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you with that one. This is how I roll. It is, Aaron, do me a favor, please sit down. And then I just keep moving. I'm not waiting for Aaron. I'm not going to stare at him. I'm not going to have a power struggle. I'm just like, keep rolling with class. Like this was a hiccup. Like, Aaron, could you please sit down? And then just keep moving, right? That is not giving that student any more attention than this specific behavior warrants. Then if it happens again, Aaron, I'm sorry. Uh, now, I, I tend to use humor and sarcasm in class. You can choose your own adventure on this one. But Aaron, I'm sorry. Uh, did you please sit down. I thought I asked that already, right? But are we cool? Everything go all right? All right. Do you need anything? Okay. Could you do, please do me a favor and sit down? It's distracting the other class and I have to teach everyone. Um, cool. And so what you're doing is it's a really quick, it's like not making it too serious. You are almost kind of joking about it. You are then telling the student why this is important because I'm teaching a class and it's distracting and someone can't see and whatever else is going on, but it's a real quick thing. And then I just move on. I'm not waiting for Aaron to answer me, right? I am just simply moving on to the next thing. So if this happens a third time and I'm not putting checks on the board, not writing people's names, none of that stuff. If it happens a third time and I have it in my head that this is happening again, I will simply ask the student to step outside, right? And so here's how I do this. This is one that kind of gets people a little bit mixed up. Uh, when I ask a kid to step outside, my st I say this so often that my students laugh at me when I do it. So I always say, Aaron, can you step outside? You're not in trouble. I just need to talk to you for a second, right? So right there, not the whole, I'm not in, you're not in trouble. What you are getting around by doing that is not having the students say back to you, for what? I didn't even do anything. They were talking. You didn't do anything. Then I didn't, I didn't say anything about talking or anything. I, I didn't. I didn't mention your behavior. I didn't say that you. Were, I actually said you weren't in trouble. And then I kindly asked you to step outside. So could you just step outside for a second? It's not a big deal. You're making it into something that it's not. And so right then you are trying to de-escalate the situation. You're talking in a very normal voice where it doesn't go too high and it doesn't go too low and it doesn't get, like show your emotion. It is making that student look like they are making a big deal out of it. But I'll tell you, as you do this during the year, I often have students that I'll say, hey, Aaron, can you step outside? And then the kid, like in unison will go, you're not in trouble. And I'm like, everybody shut up. Uh, so Aaron steps outside and then here's how I, I try and roll this. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can, uh, I'm a horrible drawler, but you will all benefit from my lack of drawing. So. Um, if this is the classroom door, uh, open. And then, <laughs> so these are, these are my little students in here, right? What I try to do is I have Aaron stands here, right? So he is standing where he is not in eye shot of anyone in the class. They cannot see him. He cannot see them. I am then standing right here. So I can see right in the door, right? But by simply turning my head or using a certain tone, those students, because I'm looking at Aaron, so I'm looking this way, cannot see me talking to him. They also can't see his emotion, his reactions, whether he's getting in trouble, whether he's not getting in trouble, whether he gets upset, whether he stays cool. They are simply still doing work and I can still talk to them. I do not like to multitask, but this is a time in my life that I cannot find an alternative to multitasking. So this is what I do. The next thing I say is, Aaron, this is what I think I'm seeing in class, right? The, I, the key word there is this is what I think I'm seeing in class. And then I tell them, next part, ready? Um, I let them say like, is this what I'm seeing in class? They get to answer me. My next question is I take the ownership for this, right? Is there something I said or did that would cause you to do that in class? And so right there, I am taking that student from defense to offense. 
And so the importance there is kids are expecting, right? If a kid's acting up in class, it's not like nine times out of 10, this isn't new for this kid, uh, that they've been through this kind of whole game before and they get pulled into the hallway and it's like, listen, this is, I am not going to take this sort of behavior in class. I am not going to put up with this. You're not going to act like this in my class. You're in fifth grade now or 10th grade now, and you need to learn how to grow up. This isn't fourth grade anymore, all right? This is a whole conversation teachers have all the time. And all that kid is hearing is it's, it becomes um, Charlie Brown. It's like, wah, 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 wah. Instead, this is what I think I'm seeing. Did I do or say anything that might cause you to be, to, for this to happen in class? And what you will find is that, again, I'd say about nine out of 10 times, the kid's gonna say no. But every one out of 10 times, you're gonna have a student that says yes. Actually, it pissed me off when you didn't call on me or I keep raising my hand or I asked to go to the bathroom 15 minutes ago and you told me to wait and now I really have to go to the bathroom. Or, you know, I'm aggravated that something happened in my last class and I was trying to talk to that kid or that kid took my AirPod or whatever it is. There is sometimes a thing that you did that is going to come out. Now, I realize that not all the things I just listed are things that I did, but it might be something that a kid came to me, tried to get my attention, and I was not giving them my attention. I then apologize. I'm so sorry. I really, I didn't even notice that you had your hand up. I'm now aware. And look, you know, all I want for you to do is be successful in my class, right? So in the going forward, if something like this happens, please feel like you can come just say it to me. Yo, Reynolds, why aren't you calling on me? I've had my hand in the air for this amount of time. And then I can address it right there, right? This is our class, but it's about you. So let's have that conversation next time instead of you doing all this other nonsense that makes us have to come in the hallway. Think so everyone thinks you're in trouble now. Like, let's just roll back and, and, be, and we're good, right? So that's part of it. The other part of it is a kid says, no, you didn't do anything. Um, so I was just throwing paper or refusing to work or had my head down or was sleeping again or was sneaking games on my computer. And then I break it down the same way for them. I need you to know, Aaron, that we are here for one reason, and that is for you to be successful. Not this and this is class. I want you to be successful in your life. I want everything you dream of to come as a result of being in my class. I, I want this to be a part of where you're going. But right now, we're not doing that. Right now, we're not finding success. Right now, we're actually finding the opposite of success. And I need you to know that you are the reason I am here. That you guys in this classroom, teach all boys, you guys in this classroom are the reason that I teach. And so I need you to pay attention. Not for me. I need you to pay attention for you. Future you is asking me to help you out right now. So I'm going to keep bothering you. But I'm not going to keep bothering. I don't want you to get twisted. I'm not going to keep bothering you because I'm taking offense to this because it matters to me. Bro, I'm going home to my family that loves me no matter what, right? But I want you to have what you dream of. Can you show up for future you? A conversation that sounds something like that is not faulting a kid. It's not blaming a kid. It's not shaming a kid. It's not making a kid feel bad. It's actually doing the opposite. It is affirming a student. It is loving them so much that I think it wears kids down and they go, yeah, I can do that. And, and so that's what we do. So in those situations, because a kid did need a moment to process sometimes, Aaron, let me tell you what, before you come back into class, you need to get a drink or go to the bathroom or anything like that. I just want to make sure they have a moment. Or you can just stand here for a moment, take a breath. When you're ready, come back into class and we just get started and we jump right into where we went. Are we good? Awesome, man. I care about you deeply. I want you to win the day. Come back in and we're going to win the day together. That's how we shift. Now, I'll tell you that most of the time, that sort of conversation has to happen many times during the year sometimes, but guess what? Leaders are repeaters. The other thing is sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes this is beyond you. And so what happens when you go back into class, you're gonna do two things, right? So if this does not work, you're gonna go back in the class. Now my wedding ring is messing this up. Um, you're gonna go back in the class and you're gonna to, you're teaching the class, kids doing something again. You walk over to them, and first, you're going to tell them, tell can I spell, um, the call, right? You're going to tell them what the phone call is, right? Or actually, no, actually, we're going to do, first, I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to pull audible here. Um, you are going to ask them if they're refusing to do work. 
and you don't have to make a big deal of it. You can walk over to the kid. Aaron, I'm sorry. Are you are you refusing to do work? Are you refusing to do what we're doing right now? Now a student has this is a yes or no answer. Yes, I am refusing, or no, I am not. Right. And if you say no, you're not, well, it doesn't look like you're doing, like you had a blank paper, your paper's on the floor under your desk, you don't have a pencil around, or you're on a different website, or like, what, like, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, are you using magic? So it is having that sort of conversation with the student, yes or no answer, are you refusing to do work? The next time it happens, you're gonna tell them what the phone call is gonna sound like. Aaron, let me tell you something. Here's what the phone call is gonna sound like when, when I call home today. I'm going to call your mom. I'm going to tell her that I asked you three times earlier to be two times earlier to be cool. Then I pulled you in the hallway and had a private conference with you. That's what this conversation sounded like. Then you came back into the classroom. You assured me that you were going to do work. I even let you have a beat outside of the classroom to kind of calm yourself, to check yourself, to come back in, to find success in class. And I even affirmed you multiple times to let them know, to let you know that all I wanted was for you to find success in class and that this wasn't about me, that it was about you. Then you were doing whatever you're doing. I will just, I will talk to your parent about that. And then I'm going to let them know that I asked you, do, are you refusing to do work? Which you either assured me that you were not, even though this is what was happening, or you told me that you were refusing to do work. And now I'm now your parent and I, your guardian and I have to have this conversation to figure out what's next. Is that the phone call that you want me to make? So I'm not gonna just say I'm gonna call home and I never do this move where you call a parent in the middle of class. That's a nonsense move, please don't do that. Um, Cause all it does is shame a kid and make them feel bad. And it feels good in the moment, but it's just like, it's that is, I think when teachers do that, it's more about them and not about students. So you then let them know what that phone call is gonna sound like. And then if the behavior persists, you can either ask a student to go to the office or step outside. Um, and, or whatever your school does in that situation because you've given multiple things, you're gonna then write that situation up and then you're gonna call home and let the parent know exactly what happened. When you call home, this is the last thing I'm gonna say because I, I did not plan on making a video this long, but when you call home, that conversation has to start with, look, before we even get into this, I need you to know that your child's success is my number one, it's my number one goal in my life. Your, ch your kid is why I'm here. So I'm calling home, not to just get them in trouble, not just to tell you that they did something that they weren't supposed to be doing. I'm gonna, it just, like, I wanna explain what took place in class. And then I'd love on the back end of this, after I tell you, if you could tell me anything that has worked in the past, if you've seen this sort of thing before and you know a teacher that did something that worked, um, or if we can figure out a solution together. And in that way, now the parent isn't being shamed, they're not being blamed, they're not being put on blast, they're not feeling like they have to be on, on defense because you are like calling and putting their kid on blast and are all angry and heated up. It's, I'm just trying to show up so we can help your kid together. And most parents can get down with that. Most parents will, will appreciate that you weren't just getting them in trouble, that you weren't just calling home, you weren't just writing them up or giving them some dumb detention. It is actually trying to work in community with parents so that you all can find a way for their student to succeed in class and beyond. And so though that's what I do when we have classroom rule breakers uh, in school. There might be a different way that you do it. I am, I am, I love learning about this stuff. So if you have a way that works for you, if you could put in the comment section below, I would love to know about it. And look, if you want to see more questions like this, you can just go right over to our Facebook group. Real Rap with Reynolds Teacher Talk is open to all educators. You have to answer like three questions to get in so we know you're not a robot and you're not like a brand trying to sell people stuff, but it's just a safe space for educators. Um, and that's it, gang. We'll see you next week. Peace.